Our first lesson will be read by Val Patterson. A reading from Isaiah. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry out to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle this morning is Canticle D and it will be sung by Durango Jenkins. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weary hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to the anxious, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God coming with judgment to save you. Then shall the eye of the blind be opened. and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then shall the lame keep like leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. Oh, oh the waters of break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. 
No ransom shall return with singing, with everlasting joy upon their hands. Joy shall be gladness shall be theirs, and sorrow will and sighing shall flee away. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Thank you, Durango. Our second lesson from the Gospel of Mark is read by Terry Roper this morning. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank be God. to God. So good morning. And uh, December 6th is the feast day of St. Nicholas of Myra. Uh, and he, uh, there's some wondering about whether or not he was at the Council of Nicaea. So I thought it would be a particularly good morning to uh, give you some teaching about the doctrine of the substance of Jesus and uh, some very detailed words in the Greek language. Actually, I'm kidding. Uh, because that sounds terrible. I'm going to take my cue, of course, from Isaiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people. And we have some stories for you, an introduction and three stories for you about um, Nicholas of Myra. That is uh, Santa, Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus. So um, here we go starts right here. Long before your grandparents, grandparents, grandparents were born, back when years were counted in only three numbers, in the city of Myra there lived a fine and generous bishop named Nicholas. He was in charge of every church in Myra, in Turkey, every single one. He lived in a fine house in the nicest part of town, and he never had to worry much about money. When he could not finish his dinner, he would say to his cook, Here, cook, give these leftovers to some hungry family. If he had old clothes, he would say to his washerwoman, Here, washerwoman, I do not need these things anymore. Let them be given to some poor fellow. 
Every year on Easter Sunday, a grand procession of deacons, acolytes, and torchbearers paraded out of the great church at the top of the hill and all around the streets of the city. Bishop Nicholas walked at the end of the procession, the position of greatest honor, wearing a splendid cloak of silk brocade and carrying a mighty silver and cedarwood staff. On these occasions, if he saw beggars in the street, he would tell his deacons, Come, brothers, toss those poor souls a coin or two. Oh, yes, Nicholas lived in comfort and ease, but it was his daily habit to turn his heart and mind towards the great mystery at the center of all things, the mystery that loves us and knows our names. This mystery was working a change in him as Nicholas sat down to his meat and wine, he found himself wondering if anyone in the city of Myra had only a crust of bread for dinner. As he went to sleep in his soft bed with its warm woolen blankets, he wondered if anyone in Myra had to sleep on the hard, cold ground. So Nicholas's comfort became bitter to him, and one night, after church, he put aside his splendid cloak and his mighty staff. Over his robe of white wool, he wrapped an old ragged cloak. He took up a plain wooden staff and slipped out unseen and alone into the streets of Myra. Here now is our first tale. Nicholas was walking through the clean, quiet streets near the church. Look, oh wait, Nicholas was Look. walking through the clean, quiet streets near the church. Look at these fine houses. These people must certainly have enough to eat. He told himself down the hill, he walked down to the harbor where the city was livelier. He had never seen this part of Myra after dark. How different things are. He said. All, all the noises seem so particularly loud. He pulled his old cloak tight around him and wished he'd brought a deacon or two for company. No one in these crowded streets paid any attention to Nicholas. Without his silk and brocade cloak and his silver and cedar wood staff, who could possibly know that he was the Bishop of Myra? Golden lamplight spilled out of every tavern door along with the smells of garlic and olive oil. The sailors in the tavern sang and shouted for more wine, and there were streams of laughter from the tavern girls in their bright, dirty clothes. Look at those children running around. Why are they awake? Surely it is past their bedtime. Can it be that they have no place to sleep? Can even little children be hungry and in need? Near the docks, men sat alone with a wineskin or slept on the ground, drunk. Why don't they go home? Do they have homes? Are they happy? I don't understand their lives at all. At last, Nicholas found a stone bench and sat and looked out at the ocean, considering all the people he had seen. I want to help them, but they are so different from anyone I have ever known before. Suppose I do the wrong thing. I can make them angry. I could even make them ashamed. And it seems to me that there are more problems here than one person can solve, even if that person is the Bishop of Myra. Sorely troubled, Nicholas turned his heart and mind towards the mystery at the center of all things and waited or love to guide him. After a while, he got up and walked to the street market where a few stalls were open late. First, he bought a big, strong sack. Then he went to the stall that sold bread and asked to buy 20 loaves of bread. 
Are these all for yourself, old fellow? Oh, no. No, no, the, they are for uh, several people. Huh. This old man must have a big family. I'll tuck in a few extra loaves. At the stall that sold old clothes, Nicholas asked to buy 10 old blankets. Are these all for your own bed, good sir? Oh, no. Why, why do these strangers keep asking me questions? No, they are not all for me. Huh. He must know someone who needs help. I'll put in a few extra. When Nicholas hoisted his sack at last, his shoulders ached from the weight of it. Never mind. All this will be of help to people, I hope. And he walked off all alone into the shadows of the city. And that very night, curious things began to happen among the people who lived down by the harbor. This young mother sleeping with her babes in the alley. How did she happen to find a beautiful loaf of new bread in her arms? She and her children ate it for breakfast and shared it with their friends. And that shiftless old man who passed out in the middle of the street, how did that warm blanket get tucked around him from his toes to his whiskery chin? All over the city, people were getting presents, but nobody knew where they had come from. The first tale teaches us that giving is a gift. And now for the second tale. Night after night, Nicholas wandered. The baker sold him bread, always with a few extra loaves. Clearly this old man must be feeding a house full of hungry people. The other stall keepers filled up his great sack with clothes and blankets and little odds and ends. Late one night, he came to a small shabby home where the lamp was still lighted. Inside, people were talking or, or were they weeping? He stopped to listen. It was a mother and father grieving together about their oldest daughter. In those days, a young woman needed a certain amount of money to get married. And these people were so poor that they could not set up their daughter in a decent home. What will become of her? She'll never have a husband or a little house or even a garden to grow roses and herbs. Perhaps she'll have to work in the taverns, dear wife, and bring wine to the sailors until daybreak. Hard work, rough work for our precious girl. Oh, my heart will break. And they clung <laughs> to one another and wept. Nicholas said to himself, Now I have a small bag of gold that would help this family, but I don't want them to feel that I expect something in return. How can I get it to them without being seen? He leaned against the wall of the house and waited for love to give him an idea. There was a chimney in the roof of the house where the smoke came out from the cooking fire. But at this time of night, there was no fire in the hearth. Nicholas tossed the bag of gold straight into the chimney. <gasps> Mercy on us, husband. The chimney is exploding. No, no, wife. Look, it's gold, gold. Soon we'll dance at our daughter's wedding. And they ran outdoors to see where the gold had come from. But Nicholas had already hurried away into the night. The second tale teaches us that faith and love act without strings. Here at last is your third tale. There was a rich man in Myra whose, whose son killed a friend in a fight over a game of cards. What trouble. Surely my son shouldn't have to be punished for this little problem. 
So he and his son cooked up a story that three sailors had tried to rob the son and his friend. The rich man went to the judge who would hear the case and gave him a fat bag of money. He told the judge, when my son comes before you at his trial, old friend, perhaps this little gift will convince you that he is innocent. At his trial, the son said, A gang of rowdy sailors attacked me and my friend. They took all of our money, and when my friend tried to fight them off, they stabbed him. What a liar! And he didn't stop there. The son picked out three sailors and said they were the killers, and the judge sentenced these three innocent men to be put to death the very next morning. Down by the harbor that night, no one could talk about anything else but this terrible injustice. Nicholas heard them talking as he wandered with his sack of bread. Everyone knew about the bag of money and the lies, but people were afraid to stand up to the wicked judge. All night, Nicholas sat awake in the church and turned his heart toward the great mystery at the center of all things, the mystery that loves us and knows our names. At dawn, the judge's doorkeeper heard a tremendous knock at the door. When he looked out, there was the Bishop of Myra with the acolytes, the deacons, the torchbearers, and even the choir who were singing a psalm. Truly, your master's heart is troubled. After all, it is no small thing to sentence three men to death. Tell the honorable judge that the Bishop of Myra is here to say his morning prayers with him. So Nicholas went in. A silent, uneasy crowd waited outside the judge's house until the judge appeared on his balcony. It is my wish that Myra should be known as a merciful and compassionate city. Therefore, I pardon these three sailors, and they are free to go. The judge's doorkeeper thought this was a fine story. Think of that crafty old judge being hauled out of bed at dawn to say his prayers. Whenever the doorkeeper wanted a cold drink or a hot meal, he'd find someone and tell the story all over again. They'd gladly treat him. And as for that wicked judge, the rich man and his son, they knew that Nicholas's eye was on them and they mended <laughs> their ways. The third story and the last for today, the third story, tells us that we can use the power we have to seek justice and to dismantle unjust systems. Amen. And may all our um, actors take a bow online. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> uh, yes. I thought it was a good time to just have some comfort and some good stories of Christmas. There are several more tales and that document will be in the weekly email that goes out tomorrow. Um, and I have really enjoyed them. So now I have some announcements, uh, not this coming Friday, but the following, uh, we have a carol sing by Zoom. And that will be led by Audrey Peterbart, Fred Peterbart's sister and a tremendous musician. Um, and we've been gathering every night by Zoom for five minutes. It's actually about four and a quarter uh, at 6 p.m. to light our Advent wreaths. Uh, the Zoom link will be in the email and it's also on the website. There's a special page for Advent and Christmas things. 
I can't even begin to tell you how fun it is. You just have to come, uh, come try. And it will be your shortest and best Zoom of the whole week. Uh, in your um, Advent guide and your Advent zine, it's Purple Ribbon and Peace Week. So um, can't wait to see what you do. Send some photos. And we have some uh, hellos and goodbyes. Uh, this is, as you may have read in last week's email, Meg Holiday has been living with us in our basement and helping uh, the kids with school, which has been a tremendous gift for the last few months. Uh, but she got a job she can't refuse. And so this is the last Sunday she'll be joining us for church from my basement. Uh, the great thing about Zoom is she might be able to join again. Um, and so the kids and I will be saying goodbye to her this, uh, this week. Uh, and then a word of congratulations. Uh, Bal Patterson, our senior warden, has just been named the missioner for the Front Range region of the Diocese of Colorado. Uh, this is a great thing. It's a job to connect and communicate and challenge all the congregations in our region. Uh, and I don't even know how many there are. Bal, or 25, 30, something like that. Here. 28. 28. Well, God be with you, and we're grateful for your leadership. Um, so go ahead. I must have forgotten that screen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And we can say hello to each other for a minute. And also and with you. Also with you. you. Also with you. Peace also be with you. you. With thy spirit. Hi, Zoe. Good to see you. Hi, Zoe. Hi, 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 Jenny. Hi. Thank you, Paul and Charlie. And, um, all the actors. <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? That was yeah, that was neat. And, and guess what? I let them know at about 10 o'clock last night. I thought, that was, I thought that was pretty great. Here's uh, Matt and Baby Thomas. Hey, kiddo. And here's Meg in our basement. Thank Hi. you, Meg. Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice to be with you. Hi. Oh, there she is. And Ava. Ava. Hi. Hi. Congratulations. Hi. Congratulations. Hi. I'm so happy for you. And do a baby cam, maybe? Oh. Oh, oh. oh she's oh. so Sweet. Oh, oh she congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And may she be blessed for her life. Mm. Amen. Amen. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Hi, right. So we're going to mute everybody, and Wes is going to give us an offertory music, and then we'll continue with our prayers. That was fun.
Thank you, Wes. Let us continue together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.